Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast, and we're here with another Lenin episode. We're talking about art and culture today, the flowering of painting and theatre, literature that took place in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. Now, there's a slander that communists, that the Bolsheviks, have and had no interest in cultural matters, and in the next 35 minutes or so, we're going to thoroughly disabuse you of that slander. And to help us with this, we have Nelson Wan, who is a member of the executive committee of the Revolutionary Communist Party, the Communists in Britain. Nelson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Joe. No problem. So, I remember a few years ago, to coincide with the centenary of the Russian Revolution, so back in 2017, there was a Royal Academy exhibition of the art of the Russian Revolution. I went myself, I think you went as well. That's right, yeah. And it was amazing, it was really inspiring, and we're going to speak about some of the art and artists that were on display today, but I think it's fair to say that some bourgeois art critics were none too impressed at this celebration of this period in Russian history, all the art that it produced. I remember there was a review at the time by a gentleman called Jonathan Jones, writing in The Guardian, who said as follows, It is a lazy, immoral lie to keep pretending there was anything glorious about the brutal experiment Lenin imposed on Russia, or anything innocent about its all-too-brilliant propaganda art. So, you know, he says it's, it's all-too-brilliant, so at least he's offering that compliment. But... Let's start with this accusation. First of all, is it true that Lenin and the Bolsheviks, the Soviet Republic, were brutal dictators who completely controlled the kind of art that was produced, um, that limited culture purely to the narrow needs of propagandizing for the party? Is that the truth? Um, well, it is, uh, it's a lie. It, it's a complete lie. Um, it's a lie that Jonathan Jones uh, and many others uh, before and many others after him uh, will repeat. Anyone with even a cursory knowledge of the art that was produced out of the, the Russian Revolution and the Russian Revolution itself, anyone that actually studies uh, what the Bolshevik position was uh, towards art and culture knows that in the first years uh, of the Russian Revolution, uh, the period of the genuine uh, revolutionary uh, movement, um, there was complete freedom for artistic creativity and expression. And that fact is expressed clearly in the art that was produced, in the amazing array of paintings, uh, sculptures, theatre productions, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, as well as architecture, uh, typography, all of these different areas. In fact, many of the world's greatest artists that we consider today um, to be pioneers in their field, people like Sergei Eisenstein, um, uh, Shostakovich, uh, the, the composer, uh, Meyerhold, the theatre director, uh, and many others, uh, Ella Zitsky, the architect, typographer, uh, graphic designer, Alexander Rodchenko, uh, they emerged from this period, uh, and they were supporters of the revolution. They gave their body and soul uh, to, the, to the revolutionary movement and to the era of change that uh, the Russian Revolution had ushered in. So Jonathan Jones is, is, is completely wrong uh, and completely mistaken uh, when he says there is nothing of value uh, in the art. And you can have whatever opinion uh, about the art that was produced. You can like it or you can dislike it. That's fine. That's, that's your personal opinion. But what you are obliged to do, I think, especially if you're an art critic or someone that appreciates art, is to understand what the Russian Revolution represented and to understand um, the significance of the artistic creativity that emerged um, in in this period. And I would say as well, I don't personally know of any other historical period where you could see a similar uh, or even close to, to, to what was achieved in, in those years of the Russian Revolution. The outburst of, of creativity, I think, is unmatched in history. Um, we haven't seen it since. And it's a common feature across history that when great social revolutions occur, it has a powerful effect on the cultural world. The French Revolution was a great inspiration, not just to artists within France, but also throughout the world. The Romantic poets, uh, Shelley, Wordsworth, before he fell off, um, were all inspired by the French Revolution, and they were inspired by this vision of a new world. And the same can be said of the Russian Revolution, in fact, on a higher level, because of the nature of that revolution. 
mm-hmm. that flung open the gilded doors of culture to ordinary people for the first time. Um, can we very quickly, because I want to talk about specific artists, I want to talk about some of the the cream of the crop as far as the Russian Revolution's um, artistic uh, legacy goes, but just to give people a bit of context, what was the policy of Lenin and the Bolsheviks towards cultural matters? Because I think there's two ways this is misrepresented. On the one hand, there's this claim that Jonathan Jones holds, that it was all just propaganda and the party kept a very tight leash on the kind of art that could be produced. Um, But there's also a view that Lenin and the Bolsheviks just weren't very interested in art and culture and they just spent all their time poring over, you know, economic treaties and um, banging on about building factories and railway lines. But uh, what was the reality? Mm. Uh, Again, if if anyone takes the time to actually study the works of of Lenin, Trotsky, their writings, what they said in, in public, and those of Marx and Engels as well, you'll see... Um, a deep love and appreciation uh, of of all things artistic uh, and, and creative. We take Lenin uh, personally for a, a example. Um, Lenin was attending uh, and, and frequenting the Moscow Art Theatre from as early as uh, 1902. He wrote letters to his mother saying how much he loved the productions. One of Lenin's most famous works, one of his greatest works, What is to be Done, is named after a Chernyshevsky novel uh, of the same name. Now, Lenin, uh, personally, whilst not making too many public comments uh, on his opinions on art, he was a bit of a conservative sort of classicist, really, when it comes to his own personal taste. By his own admission, we should say. It's not something that we're, uh, that we're retroactively imposing on his tastes. Ex- exactly, exactly. Um, he made a, a serious effort to defend um, the creativity and expression um, of the avant-garde uh, experimental Russian artists. He defended them against uh, prolet cults, which we'll probably mention a bit uh, uh, later. This idea of um, um, disregarding so-called uh, bourgeois uh, art in favor of so-called proletarian art, which is a mistaken uh, idea. Um, and you take many of the quotes of, of Lenin and Trotsky on art. I'll just quote one example from, from Trotsky Please. Uh, on, on art. He said in, in 1938, a truly revolutionary party is neither able nor willing to take upon itself the task of leading and even less of commanding art, either before or after the conquest of power. Truly intellectual creation is incompatible with lies, hypocrisy, and the spirit of conformity. Art can become a strong ally of revolution only insofar as it remains faithful to itself. And I think that that statement from Trotsky really encapsulates the Bolsheviks' position towards art, the position of Lenin Trotsky personally, and also the position of the Bolshevik uh, government and the commissariat of the Enlightenment uh, who were in charge of artistic and, and cultural affairs. That's an amazing name for uh, government departments, actually. It's quite incredible. And I think that it speaks to the political attitude that the Bolsheviks took towards art and culture. And it's something that we're trying to emphasize a lot more in the IMC, actually. And you might have noticed if you're subscribed to the Independence of Marxism theoretical magazine, which you should be, that there's been a lot more in the way of reviews and comments on works of art, on literature. We had a really good review of The Dubliners recently by James Joyce. Um, we, I think, are preparing an article on Faust as well. And the way that the Bolsheviks saw part of their task after taking power was they were preparing the working class to be the leaders of society. And part of that was conquering culture, starting with the highest achievements of bourgeois art, actually, you know, the Shakespeare's and the Beethoven's and so on, Um, the Tchaikovsky's as well, of course. Um, And having mastered that, it's part of the political education of the working class upon taking control of society. And... We have to be realistic, and Lenin was realistic at the time, that the cultural level of the Russian proletariat, and particularly the peasantry, was very low. Illiteracy was very high. But the Bolsheviks took amazing steps forward to overcome those limitations. Um, they, They built lots of schools. They made a very conscious and deliberate effort to raise the level of literacy, expropriated the private art collections of the wealthy aristocracy and bourgeoisie and made them available to the public. Uh, during the Civil War, they had these agitprop trains that would go into the countryside and they'd show peasants films that reflected their lives and 
this was often the first time that peasants had ever encountered cinema. And not only was it amazing for them, and not only did it raise their cultural sites, but it was also a testament to the modernizing policy that the Bolsheviks had. So it wasn't as though um, ingratiating the masses into art and culture was a secondary matter. It was part and parcel of the revolutionary tasks that the Bolsheviks and Lenin were faced with. That's right. That, that's absolutely correct. Um a lot of the art that um, that was was produced in the, in this period uh, that was uh, supported by the Bolshevik government, um, a lot of people like Jonathan Jones, for example, would say, "Oh, uh, it's propaganda. Oh, uh, there's no sort of real genuine uh, content to it." And they make reference to things like the uh, Bolshevik agit agit prop trains. You know, I've got an image here of. Uh, of, of what they might look like. So I'm just going to have to give apologies to those of you who are listening to this podcast audio only. Uh, Nelson has very kindly brought along some visual aids, which is appropriate enough for an episode about art. This episode will be on YouTube and it's been videoed. So if you want to have the visual component as well, you can follow the link from Spotify or Apple or wherever you're listening and watch the video as well. Sorry, Nelson, carry on. Yeah, exactly. It's easy for someone to say, um, oh, the agitprop trains which brought music, gramophones, they brought cinema projections, uh, they brought pamphlets uh, and written literature um, to the peasant masses and to the people in rural areas of Russia. It's easy to say, oh, that's propaganda. But the cultural level, as you say, and the economic level of Russia was incredibly low in this period. Most of the population was uh, illiterate, in fact. Um, the, the peasantry had little to no understanding of art or culture. And so this was really uh, an incredible sort of bursting open of the doors of, of culture uh, to them who, who they'd, never seen, uh, they'd never seen anything like this before. Uh, the Bolshoi Ballet uh, as well was opened to peasants, to workers, uh, to deputies. The Moscow Art Theatre, founded by uh, Konstantin Stanislavski, uh, another great artist sort of um, becoming world-renowned in this period, uh, they opened their doors to free. Uh, for workers, uh, to peasants, and, and to other people. In fact, I have a quote, actually, as well, which I think perhaps um, better expresses the nature of the change that took place um, that the Russian Revolution uh, brought in. So the quote is, The doors of our theatre open exclusively for poor people. Our performances were free to all who received their tickets from factories and institutions where we sent them, and we met face to face right after the issuance of the decree with spectators altogether new to us, many of whom, perhaps the majority, knew nothing not only of our theatre, but of any theatre. I remember one peasant, who was a good friend of mine, who came once a year with the express purpose of seeing our entire repertoire. And after dinner, he would ask us for news of our theatre with even greater joy and go to the theatre in his wonderful costume. Watching the performance, he would redden and pale uh, from excitement and enthusiasm, and when the play ended, he could not return home to sleep. He walked alone for hours in the streets in order to clarify his impressions. Having seen our entire repertoire, he returned to his home for the ensuing year. From there, he would write numerous philosophical letters which helped him to digest and continue to live over the store of impressions which he had brought home with him uh, from Moscow. I think that not a few such spectators appeared at our theatre. We felt their presence and our artistic duty towards them. That's really amazing. And for, from whom is that quote? That is uh, from Konstantin Stanislavski in his autobiography, My Life in Art. And notably, this man was not a Bolshevik. This right. was not a communist. Um, in what way could you describe Stanislavski as some sort of communist uh, propagandist? He was not. In fact, he was invited to be part uh, of the Bolshevik government when the revolution happened, but he declined politely saying that his realm was the realm of art, uh, and he'd like to focus on that rather than uh, politics. But throughout his life, he constantly maintained that the uh, Bolshevik government gave him and his theatre complete freedom um, to pursue uh, its whatever direction it, uh, it wanted. In fact, I have another small quote, if you'll uh, of course. Al allow me. So Stanislavski said this in 1928. In those days, the days of the, the Russian Revolution, um, the government came to our help, and thanks to it, our theatre was able to weather the storm. But our government earned my deepest gratitude for something quite different. Our government did not force us to dye ourselves red and pretend to be something we were not. In addition to this, um, aside from things like the uh, agitprop trains, 
uh, and the propaganda posters, which I think have incredible artistic content, uh, aside from the, the political aims of them. You take a look at the Bolshevik policy towards um, the, um, the arts that were emerging. Uh, the Bolsheviks decided to nationalize a lot of the theaters in order to support them. Now, the lie that is told by the sort of bourgeois commentators is that this was to curtail freedom. This was to push communist propaganda. When actually, if you look at the theaters that were nationalized, um, the Alexandrinsky, for example, uh, the Mali theater, uh, Mali meaning small uh, theater, the Bolshoi Valley is the big uh, uh, theater. Um, the actual Bolshevik government policy was to insist upon a classical repertoire, to insist on Shakespeare, uh, Schiller, uh, Pushkin, uh, and many others. Now, it would be ridiculous to suggest that the Bolsheviks insisting on productions of Pushkin and Schiller and Lord Byron would constitute communist propaganda. But that is the argument that is told by the bourgeois, and it is completely false. Right. And it shows that there was absolutely no philistinism or narrowness when the Bolsheviks considered art and culture. We'll talk a bit more about the debates that Lenin and Trotsky had with the product cult because it's relevant to this point. But I just wanted to refer back to the first Stanislavski quote because it's a really, really touching um, story. And it speaks to the way that art and culture really ennobles the soul. You have people who were treated like beasts of burden for their entire lives and suddenly on the basis of a social revolution where they're grasping their own destiny for the first time, they're beginning to see themselves as human beings. That's really what this means. And it all goes together. It's not just a question of raising living standards, although it is that. It's not just a question of building workers' democracy, though it is that. It's also opening the horizons of people who've lived in absolute oppression and destitution to um, higher levels of thought, higher levels of philosophy. That's what the Bolshevik cultural policy really meant. I want to talk now about some specific figures, and since we talked about Stanislavski already, and I know that you've got a bit of a theatrical background, Nelson, so I'm sure you're personally invested in Stanislavski in particular, but what was his significance and what do we owe him today? Hmm. So Stanislavski um, created what, what is known as, as the system. Now, Stanislavski's system um, was in effect the discovery of a way of systematically uh, achieving realism uh, in uh, theatrical productions, in acting, basically. Um, all of the theatre sort of practitioners before Stanislavski, the, the, the theoreticians, people that would write about um, acting technique, they had an idea of what they would sought to achieve, which is realistic, emotionally engaging performances, but no one had discovered an actual method of doing so. Stanislavski discovered those laws. He discovered the method uh, of how to, how to achieve this. And it was in very sort of a succinct um, uh, words. It's a combination of psychological uh, techniques and preparation and external um, sort of characterization and study of a text and, and things like that. Now, um, most people are probably familiar in one way or another with uh, the term method acting which is made famous by a lot of, you know, uh, famous actors. In the, yeah, uh, Marlon the Brando and Daniel Day-Lewis. Ex exactly, Marilyn Monroe, etc. Et cetera. Um, and I think, uh, I personally think uh, method acting is quite misunderstood sort of uh, uh, these days. It has, a, it has a bad reputation, but, but method acting emerged from Stanislavski's uh, system. Um, and it has, in, in my opinion, dominated the 20th and the 21st century uh, of acting. Most actors in... Um, aim to achieve uh, realism um, in, in, in one form or another, basically. It's not the only game in town. But most people try and be realistic when they, when they, uh, when they act and perform. And we should be clear, that wasn't always the case. If you look at the theatre of feudalism, if you look at the pre-20th century tradition, there was a lot of stand and deliver. There was lots of walk to the middle of the stage, say your piece directly to the audience then stand back and let the other actor come in and do their bit. Um, notions of realism as we know them were by no means universal. That's right, that's right. Um, and of course, um, Stanislavski, when he sort of uh, pioneered uh, this method, wasn't initially uh, understood. A lot of the productions um, he put on early on in, in the Moscow Art Theatre were terribly received. But as time sort of went by, um, and actually, it's in the period um, uh, after the Russian Revolution uh, when the Moscow Art Theatre embarked on its world tours and, and sort of um, tours across Europe and America that Stanislavski really became appreciated as, as the genius uh, that, he, that he was. Um, and again, it's, it's worth 
saying that Stanislavski was, well, not only um, uh, personally supported by people like uh, Lenin, uh, Lunacharsky, uh, uh, and others, um, Stanislavski um, maintained throughout his, his career that actually um, th the Russian Revolution helped to bring about, first of all, this cultural awakening of all of the masses, as evidenced in his quotes, but also that the Bolshevik government uh, supported him. That sadly uh, would change with the Stalinist uh, counter-revolution, which would curtail all of the, the freedom uh, of, of Stanislavski and other artists later on. Yeah, and of course, the actual policies of the Stalinists, the rigid adherence to so-called socialist realism or Soviet realism, offer some grist to the mill of the slanders of the Jonathan Joneses of the world. But we'll come to that later on. Let's talk about cinema. Because in another life, I was a film academic. Uh, that was my discipline. And academia today in particular is riddled with all sorts of terrible ideas. Film departments, I have to say, are some of the worst when it comes to terrible postmodern philosophy. But at the very least, it's widely acknowledged that the influence of Soviet montage over contemporary cinema is decisive. People like Ziga Vertov and particularly Sergei Eisenstein were the teachers of modern cinematography. Without them, we don't have editing as we know it. What you have basically are static tableau. If you look at most cinema of the 1900s, 1910s, even throughout the middle of the 1920s, it's very static. It's very staid, it doesn't have any energy, it doesn't really use the language of cinema to animate the story, it just puts a play in front of a camera. And uh, people like Vertov and Eisenstein completely transformed the art form. I'd say they actually made it into an art form. I would say that before the Soviet cinematographic tradition, um, cinema was just a tool that was used to disseminate theatre and other things. But um, let's talk about some of the artists. Let's talk about Eisenstein, because he's probably the defining um, film director and artist of the period. Yeah, um, Sergei Eisenstein, uh, many still consider, you know, uh, to be one, one of, if not the greatest uh, film director uh, of all time. Um, now, some of the amazing films that um, Sergei Eisenstein sort of produced um, in the sort of years after the Russian Revolution include uh, Strike, um, October, 10 Days That Shook the World, and of course Battleship uh, Potemkin, which makes uh, incredible use of Soviet montage theory, theory in, in the very famous Odessa uh, step sequence, which I think is uh, probably one of the most uh, sort of um, uh, revered sort of clips, I think, of, 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 of cinema history. It's, it's made reference to many, many yeah. times. And rightly so. It, it's available in full on YouTube, so um, everyone should go and watch it. As soon as you're done watching this video, Exactly. The power of, of montage theory is that um, um, people like uh, Eisenstein and Lev Kuleshov as well. Yeah, the Kuleshov effect, of course, is it, the, um, the defining principle of Soviet montage. Exactly. The principle is that they take um, sort of a seemingly unrelated uh, scenes, uh, images and, and moving reels, combine them in a certain way, um, and it can have a certain effect, an emotional effect. Yeah, There's the really famous example is where you've got three shots of um, a man with the same mutual expression and then you follow that with a shot of um, food covered in maggots, um, of a child crying, of their beloved and you say, oh, that man is hungry or that man is angry or that man is um, in love. And actually, the image is the same, but it's the interrelation. It's the dialectical collision between those two images that create the emotional effect. Precisely. That, that's exactly right. And um, the films of Sergei Eisenstein make amazing use uh, of, of this. You mentioned uh, uh, Ziga Vertov as, as well, his famous uh, film Man with a Movie Camera, mm -hmm. sort of making incredible yeah. use of um, sort of uh, montages and uh, superimpositions, experimental shots. Um, and some of the first um, documentary films, as we know them, were made uh, in, in this period as well, anniversary of the, uh, the revolution, um, 1919, uh, I believe, was the very first documentary film um, ever made. And just another note on sort of um, on, on Eisenstein, 
Um, his first film that was produced, Strike, again, which is a brilliant film. I, I recommend everyone have a look at it. I think it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, he used actors that were trained in the Mayerhold Theatre. Uh, Mayerhold as well as a revolutionary sort of theatre director from this period. Um, Shostakovich was a pianist in one of Mayerhold's theatre. So you see, I, I think it's almost like this constellation of artistic genius uh, that sort of emerges uh, in, in this period. Um, later on um, in Sergei Eisenstein's life, he actually traveled to America. Um, and I think it's a damning in the, uh, sort of indictment of American capitalism, of, of the capitalism in, in general, and sort of the true sort of Philistine attitude of the bourgeois class when it comes to art. Um, in that Sergei Eisenstein was basically prevented from making a single feature length film whilst he was there uh, in, in the West. In fact, in America, he was subject to vicious anti-communist propaganda campaigns uh, to slander his name um, and to prevent him from conducting any work. Yeah, that's right. And he lived out much of the rest of his life in relative obscurity. Fortunately, the contributions that he made um, managed to seep their way through the Iron Curtain and continue to have a really important influence over filmmakers today. He's one of the most widely cited filmmakers. David Lynch is an enormous fan of Sergei Eisenstein. Uh, Spielberg is a fan of Eisenstein. There are, I would say, no modern film directors who don't pay at least some open homage to Eisenstein. So in spite of the efforts of the capitalists to bury him, uh, he remains immortal. I can't help but spy across the table probably the most iconic piece of visual arts from the Russian Revolution. So for those of you who are listening, it's Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge by El Lazitsky. I think that this is probably, if you would ask the man on the street, um, can you remember a piece of art from the Russian Revolution, they might not know the name, but they know that image immediately and they say, oh yeah, that's Russian Revolution, that's Lenin Bolsheviks, Russian Revolution. What is so special about this piece of art? Yeah, I think this is arguably the defining image of, of, of the Russian Revolution, uh, just holding it up to, uh, to the audience there. It really is incredible uh, what's, what Elizitsky managed uh, to do here. It was produced in 1919 during the Russian Civil War. And this is not a painting. Um, this is a propaganda poster that was produced um, to help the fight against the white armies, uh, to help the red army uh, defeat the armies of reaction. And uh, it's, it's an expression of the need to defend the Russian revolution and of course everything that uh, was gained as, as a result of it. Now what's incredible about this image is that in basically two or three colors, we're talking red, white, uh, a bit of black, um, and using simple geometric shapes. Elizitsky manages to express everything that the revolution is um, and the need to sort of um, change uh, society. We look at the sort of image of the red wedge. It's sharp, it's forceful, it's penetrating the inert sort of white uh, reactionary uh, circle. It's angular, it's, it's forward, it's moving forward um, in, into the future. Um, and what's incredible about this is that it is incredibly abstract. It's a highly abstract uh, piece of art, and yet you get a sense of what it's about straight away. Yeah, it tells you the story immediately. And you don't have to have any cultural education. You don't even really have to know about the state of the war effort. You can immediately see, the, at, the very late, at the very least, the essence of the, the narrative that the artist is trying to portray. Exactly. Um, and in this um, piece, I, I mentioned it's a propaganda poster. It's meant to be mass produced and distributed sort of um, everywhere. Again, this is a sort of a, a very sort of modern um, piece of art that is, that is being produced, not a painting in a, in a traditional uh, sense. Now, um, propaganda, that word is used often to sort of slander the artistic um, uh, sort of uh, the artistic output of the Russian Revolution, an artist like Elizitsky, and, and artworks like this, in fact. Um, the argument is made is that because there is political content um, to this art, it somehow debases it or makes it less um, uh, less artistic, less, less creative. Now, I would say that the artistic and the political intentions of an artwork like this, in fact, align. I would say that the political content, the propaganda content of this actually strengthens uh, the artwork. If you consider 
what it was uh, that was taking place uh, and what it was that the Red Army and the Bolsheviks and people like Elizitsky were fighting to defend. They're fighting to defend um, a new world, a world that is worth uh, living in for ordinary uh, people uh, ac across Russia and the world. We're talking about the fate of the Russian and the world revolution uh, on the line. So yes, it's propaganda, absolutely, but it's of a mass character. It's propaganda of the masses fighting back against the oppressors that have enslaved and brutalized them um, for so long. And the power of that message, I think, strengthens an artwork like this rather than uh, debases it. And there are plenty of other great artists from this period we could talk about. We haven't even spoken about Tatlin and his famous, sadly, unbuilt Tatlin Tower that was going to be the Presidium of the Comintern. We haven't spoken about Mayerhold in any depth, but I recommend that anyone listening who's interested in this, go and watch um, Nelson's lead-off or listen to Nelson's lead-off from the Revolution Festival last year, where he goes into a bit more depth about the art of the Russian Revolution. We also have articles on the website, and there's an article in a previous issue of the Idol magazine about Stanislavski by Nelson, which is also very good, so give that a read. We've alluded to it a few times, so let's get into it. The product cult. What exactly was it, and what was the objection that Lenin in particular and Trotsky held towards it? So uh, the Product Cult was a, a mass organization. It was a mass artistic uh, creative group uh, and it was headed by an individual called uh, Alexander uh, Bogdanov uh, who's a former Bolshevik and actually someone that Lenin uh, polemicized uh, against uh, in his uh, wonderful uh, philosophical work uh, Materialism uh, and Imperial Criticism. Um, now, Prolet Cult, uh, in short, sought to create a new uh, proletarian culture, what they call proletarian culture. Hence, Prolet Cult. Exactly. Out of, out of nothing, basically. The argument that they made was that the art of, of the previous uh, period, um, we're talking not just sort of like any old art, but we're talking some of the greatest artists that the world has, has ever seen, uh, your Shakespeare's, your Pushkin's, etc., all of that sort of stuff, even some of the stuff that um, Stanislavski uh, produced in his Moscow Art Theatre. To, to probably call all of that was bourgeois. And they said because it's sort of bourgeois, it's reactionary and it needs to be, in fact, destroyed uh, and replaced with a new sort of art that um, somehow and somewhere or another represents uh, the proletariat uh, as a class. That is, in short, what Product Cult was about. And the objection, I think, from Lenin's point of view, was twofold. On the one hand, he thought that the Product Cult was completely idealist in its outlook. He was saying, look, guys, you're talking about building a new proletarian culture. We are in the middle of a civil war. We're starving to death. We have to have school kids sharing one pencil between five. Illiteracy is still rampant. People are struggling to survive. The revolution is hanging on by its fingertips. If there's going to be any culture left behind after this revolution, the first priority has to be defending the revolution, but also raising the general level. And the second objection that Lenin raised, and Trotsky goes into a lot of depth in this in his masterful collection, Literature and Revolution, is that the working class hasn't been educated in culture. It's hasn't got the tools, it hasn't got the history, it hasn't got the education that the bourgeois had. And this is the thing, art, appreciating creating art is not something that you can just do um, spontaneously. You can't just do it naturally. It's a thing you have to learn. It requires skill and practice and training and expertise. And the bourgeois had that. They had hundreds of history, uh, years of history to build upon. They had a powerful tradition. Those great artists, as you say, and Trotsky and Lenin said that the working class needed to master the art of the old world before they could even think about trying to redefine culture in their image. Also, ultimately, uh, this may come as a shock to some of you, we don't want a proletariat. <laughs> Under communism, when you abolish class society, there would be no working class. Nobody would be defined by the need to work to survive. Um, so the task of the working class is actually ultimately through raising the cultural level, building socialism, building communism, to abolish itself as a class. So at the point where the proletariat is the ruling class, it's already taking the steps that would make that, that would make proletarian culture a misnomer because you can't have proletarian culture if there's no proletariat what you just have is culture 
uh, culture on an immensely higher level, as Trotsky also explain in his text, you'll be utilising the whole creative potential of humanity, not just the elite on top, not just a, a privileged minority. Everybody would have the time and means to learn how to, how to write plays, how to write literature, how to paint, how to sculpt. They'd be able to fulfil their full creative capacity. So the product cult was wrong on a number of levels. And what's interesting to me, in spite of the slanders, Lenin and Trotsky didn't just shut them down by rope. They didn't just wield the whip of the state apparatus to shut them down. They debated with them openly, and they took the questions seriously. They engaged with them on their own terms. That's exactly right, um, Joe. The problem was never the art that Prolet cults produced. Um, it was the direction where they wanted to take all of art in Russia. Um, in addition to all of the things you mentioned, what Prolet Cult was arguing is that they alone should have the monopoly on the artistic production of Russia. And such a position as that is intolerable, obviously, to any sort of thinking and feeling person. And it was intolerable to the Bolsheviks. And yet, as you say, the position of Lenin, of Krupskaya, of others, was to try and convince, through argument, Prolet Cult, to put aside the quest for, you know, uh, so-called proletarian arts and actually focus their efforts on raising the cultural level of the Russian masses, which was desperately needed. Um, that was what Lenin uh, tried to argue to them. And it was only once arguments were made uh, and maneuvers were made to try and monopolize art that Lenin had to sort of step in eventually uh, and, and sort of fold product cult back into the, um, into the main government uh, bodies. But it was never done uh, in a sort of bureaucratic way, in a heavy-handed way. They very much um, appreciated, I think, some of the support that the product cult gave uh, to the Bolshevik government initially. In fact, they were probably the first, if not um, you know, the only in, a few, uh, in, in the initial period, artistic group that did support the Bolshevik uh, government. Um, that wasn't the problem. The problem is when they said, we alone want to determine artistic policy. You can't have such a policy uh, and maintain artistic freedom. So much more insidiously, let's talk about what happened after Lenin's death, after the bureaucratic degeneration of the Russian Revolution, because I think it's fair to say that also precipitated a degeneration of culture. Ex exactly. There is a river of blood that separates Stalinism and genuine Bolshevism um, not only politically, but artistically, uh, culturally and creatively in all these other ways. Um, socialist uh, realism, uh, so-called socialist uh, realism, was the art form that was promoted by the Stalinist bureaucracy. Um, and it purports to represent the so-called ideals of, of a socialist society. But in essence, what socialist realism was, was just a promotion of the interests of the Stalinist bureaucracy uh, and of Stalin. So what Stalinism meant for artistic creativity um, is a complete curtailing of all of the experiments, all of the individuality, all of the expression that emerged um, after the Russian Revolution in favor of stale, state-sponsored, um, regimented arts, which had no real artistic or free content. I have an example of, of, uh, of, such, a, of such an artwork. We have here uh, Roses for Stalin, uh, which was produced in, in 1949. Oh, dear God. Yes, this, we have a quite charming image of uh, a bunch of happy for children. One, for once, those of you <laughs> listening to the audio version are lucky because this is pretty appalling. There is very little artistic content in, uh, in, in works like this, I believe. But this is the sort of thing that uh, Stalin actively promoted. Just to offer a bit of a description um, for those of you who can't see, it's a vapid... Um, colourful painting of Stalin in a white uniform being handed a garland of white and red roses by some rosy-cheeked children in a nice green field. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself, Joe. Um, this, this was the sort of thing that was pr promoted uh, under Stalinism at the detriment of um, actual creative uh, expression. And obviously communists strive for a world where art and artists are free to explore and to experiment and develop their craft and to make our world more attractive, um, more enriched and livelier. And I think that as bad as things became under the Stalinist Soviet Union, 
we have to say that capitalism today is waging an open war on culture. You look at the swathe of cuts to arts institutions and to arts and literature classes in state schools in, in Britain and throughout the world. The Arts Council in Britain is having its departmental budgets slashed again, and they've been slashed continually ever since the Thatcher years, basically. And if you look at the state of art today in every sphere you could imagine, from, from cinema to video games to literature, it's just... a lot of it is just so trite. I mean, you've got these gaudy blockbusters these this endless cookie cutter procession of superhero movies that I think audiences are now finally getting bored with. Um, it, it feels like culture is in a real rut imposed by the market, and that's not the subject of this episode. We can talk about that perhaps in future. The general crisis of culture under capitalism, the struggles that artists face. We haven't even talked about AI, about AI so-called art, but. I think that it's better to end on a positive note because we're talking about a really progressive moment for human culture and a moment from which we still draw inspiration. So I think I'm going to end this with a question, Nelson. Why is it that communists should care about culture? If you're listening to this and you're saying to yourself, well, I'm not an artsy guy, I, I like history and economics and politics and what have you, why do you say, no, actually, if you're a communist, then you should care about culture? I think um, you answered that sort of um, uh, in, in one of the comments you made earlier in that um, the fight um, of communists, what we are struggling for, what we're trying to achieve is not simply a struggle to earn higher wages. It's not to have just a roof over our head, bread to eat, all of these things, although we do need these things and capitalism deprives ordinary working class people of these things. It's about having a, wor a world that is worth living in. It's about having a life that is worth living in to have our friends uh, and loved ones um, enjoy existing uh, in this world. And art gives us that. Art fundamentally is about uh, communication. It's about expression. And art shows us, and the best art that has been produced, shows us that life can be something more than what it is. And if you look at capitalist society today, you've already mentioned some of the uh, terrible impacts of this system on art and creativity, not even to mention the actual standard of living and the crisis uh, and all of these other things. Art is sometimes the, uh, and often I think, uh, a refuge for people uh, in this sort of a, um, a terrible sort of um, a system that we that we live under. And so I would say it is the duty of, 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 of communists to take things like art seriously, uh, to appreciate art because it shows and expresses what we are fighting for, which is for a world that is that is worth living in. Um, and one where we can express ourselves freely and relate to one another as genuine human beings. Yeah. I mean, as Marx famously said, nothing human is alien to me. I think that if you're watching this episode, listening to this episode, not only do we say that you should read about the Bolshevik policy towards art, learn about the Russian Revolution and the artists that it's produced, but you should go out and read literature. You should go out and watch movies, go to the theatre. You should raise your own cultural level. Because if we're serious about building a revolutionary party that can lead the working class into the new world, then we also have to master the cultural products of humanity because that's part of the world we're trying to build. It makes you a better person. It makes you a better communist. So... Um, don't take a philistine attitude towards art. And I think that that's really one of the most important lessons of Lenin's attitude towards art and culture and the policy of the Russian Revolution towards art and culture. Absolutely. Okay, well, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Nelson. I really enjoyed that discussion. If you enjoyed it as well, please share this episode. Also, we'd really appreciate it if you could post a comment, if we're talking about YouTube or a review, if you're on a podcast platform. It really helps to tame the algorithm and get um, the episode to more eyes and ears. Share this episode with the hashtags Communism Podcast and also Lenin Lives because this is part of the Lenin series. We're going to do one of these a month always a video episode on a different aspect of Lenin's life, works, and thoughts. And the very last thing, 
I'm going to be incessantly plugging the manifesto of the Revolutionary Communist International. It's an amazing document. And also the upcoming, in June, founding conference of the Revolutionary Communist International, which will be the first Revolutionary Communist International in living memory with a clean banner, genuinely upholding the principles of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. All the information, all the links relevant to that will be in the description of this episode. But for now, I think that I'm going to say goodbye to Nelson. Bye, Joe. Thanks for having me. And I'll say goodbye to you as well. See you next week.